Hi, and uh, welcome to today's session of Lunches with Legends, where we connect with some of the most illustrious individuals in the financial world while supporting the vital healthcare organizations in our communities. Just before we begin, I want to thank our key sponsors of this series, particularly our gold sponsor, KPMG. We are really grateful to KPMG for their friendship and very generous support, as well as our uh, silver sponsors, Ventera Realty, Craig and McConnell Group, and TD Bank. We are so appreciative of your generosity. And I just want to remind everyone that 100% of the dollars you donate through this event will go toward COVID-19 relief and pediatric mental health. So if you have not yet made your donation, please take a moment, go to the donation page at the top right of this site. We greatly appreciate your support. So now without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, Ms. Stacy Cunningham. So Stacy is the president of the NYSE Group, which includes the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest equity exchange and premier venue for raising capital. She is the NYSE's 67th president and the first woman to lead the exchange in its 228 year history. She oversees an organization that is home to 2,200 of the world's largest, most influential and most innovative companies. And in addition to the NYSE, she oversees four other equity exchanges with nearly $4 trillion of listed assets under management and to equity options exchanges. And if all of that wasn't enough, Stacy also spearheaded the development and launch of the world's most sophisticated exchange technology platform. She had led the progress on important issues such as you know, board diversity um, through the New York's NYSE Board Advisory Council. She served, uh, she serves as the um, and the Global Executive Committee of the Intercontinental Exchange, which is the parent company of NYSE. And she also sits on the board uh, of directors for Catalyst, the partnership for New York City, and serves as a passionate advocate for uh, the role of open and free markets to drive economic growth and societal advancement. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest, Stacy Cunningham. Stacy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mo, and, and thanks for that really gracious introduction. It makes me feel really good about, about, about me. Uh, but most importantly, thank you to everybody who's been donating to the cause. It's such an important cause, and I appreciate your hosting this event and for everyone who's contributing to it for to help pediatric mental health and, and in response to COVID-19. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and the introduction is well-deserved and probably understated. But just to get uh, to dive right in, you know, you've had this really remarkable journey to get to the helm of the NYSE. And, you know, when you look back uh, on that journey, you know, are there any specific people or events and perhaps even in your childhood that you would point to as having the most transformative impact on you? No, it's it's funny, and the, the short answer is yes, and I, it's hard to pick just one because I think there are so many events and so many people that you encounter throughout your life that influence you in small and big ways, and sometimes those small ways are the ones that really have a, a much larger outsized impact on on how you operate and how you go forward. So there are so many events that that were what seemed at the time little events, like a summer internship on the trading floor at the New York Stock Exchange when I had no interest in finance. Uh, right. You know, that that certainly ended up being such a significant part one summer job as to where I would end up today. I didn't know that I was going to fall in love with the financial markets. I had no idea. But one person that I that I highlight a lot as having a really significant impact on, on my career is somebody I never met. And that's Muriel Siebert, because she was the first woman to become a member of the New York Stock Exchange in mm -hmm. 1967. It took 175 years to get one woman who who busted her way into that boys club. And because she became a member, I never even thought about it when I started working on the trading floor. I didn't think about my gender at all. I'm not somebody who really thought that was a barrier I had to, had to overcome. I was very fortunate, but I recognized the fact that I was fortunate because somebody else had already done that hard work. So right. I took that as a really meaningful lesson for me that anytime we redefine boundaries, we're redefining them not just for ourselves, but for everybody else who follows you know, she became a member in 1967. I, I walked onto the trading floor for the very first time in 1995. And I had no idea the impact of what she had done on my, my career and my life. Interesting. And now your path to the presidency was, was in itself unique. You know, you began your, as you mentioned, your career at NYSE. And then somewhere in the middle, uh, it seems like you jumped ship 
you studied culinary arts, became a chef. So can you tell us like a little bit about that and how you, um, and, or I should say, as you migrated from, you know, being a chef de cuisine to chief of New York Stock Exchange, like what unique perspectives did that experience bring to your world today? Okay, I'll give you the real version, which is a little bit different than the versions you read in, in some of the magazine articles reading about me, because I actually never sure. earned a living as a chef, which is a little bit of a, uh, a, a distinction. But I, I had a passion for cooking and food. And so when I started my career back as an intern, I didn't work for the New York Stock Exchange itself. I, I worked for a trading firm, one of the most sophisticated trading firms out there. And I worked on the, the trading floor as a, a specialist. So we were market makers in, in all those securities that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a really unique part of the NYSE market model is that every company that's listed has a market maker who's responsible for overseeing trading in their, in their stock. So that was my job. And I did that for about 10 years on the floor. I left in 2005 and I knew it was time for me to move on for a number of reasons, but one of them being the pace of change and technology adoption at that time. But when I made that decision, I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go. And I knew that I was gonna always love to eat and love to cook. And so I thought I'd go to culinary school while I figured out what my next step would be. And I, I, I thought that that decision was going to be limited to a diversion for, for several months. What I noticed very quickly when I was working in a kitchen as part of, as part of that education was the skill set was actually similar to working on a trading floor. The environment in the kitchen wasn't, wasn't that different. And maybe that's part of what drew me to that, to that space. But you learn a lot in an environment in a kitchen, right? I mean, you have to communicate really quickly really uh, effectively and clearly because you don't really have a whole lot of time to do for do-overs or to make mistakes and to rework and to, to plan. You're working really under pressure. There, there's a lot of elements to that time that I see and I implement in my day-to-day -day now. And so I think the lesson from that is your skills prepare you for whatever you end up doing later in life. And people should be less focused on what their experience is in a particular job and more what skills they have, what's in the toolbox, and how can they apply those tools to whatever is put in front of them. So mm -hmm. I had 10 years as a trader. I did the, the time in, the, in culinary school and working in a kitchen. I spent time customer facing. When I, when I came back to the industry, I worked at NASDAQ for several years. And in, that, in those, most of those roles, I was a customer facing sales, salesperson. And then when I came to the New York Stock Exchange and to work for the exchange itself for the first time was, was December of 2012. It was 10 days before we got announced, a deal, a deal was announced that we were being acquired. And at that time, I was really starting to put all the pieces of my background and my career and my engineering trading, my undergraduate degree in together with all of those things to, to prepare me for the chief operating officer role. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, I mean, first of all, thank you for clarifying. I mean, you can never let a good legend get ruined by the fact. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I should just, I should just lean into it. And, you know, <laughs> no, my, is... my colleagues here do. They tease me about being a James Beard award-winning chef. And it's like, I never <laughs> even got a paycheck as a chef. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I, but your point is, great. Uh, <laughs> that's great. So, but I, I mentioned earlier uh, that you've been a strong advocate for public markets, like really from way back, but you know, what is it about public markets that interested you most? And, and particularly at a time like today when the divide between uh, Wall Street and Main Street, we were just talking about this before, is so dramatic. Like what unique role do you see public markets playing in society? I think it's such an important question and I don't think we can stop paying attention to it. And when I was first drawn to this industry, I'll be honest, it wasn't about the, it, the values of the public markets. It was more the pace and the energy and the environment on the trading floor. And I was really captured uh, by financial markets and, and that, that in, they, they were really what was interesting to me. It was later in my career that I began to really understand and appreciate what that meant and what was happening. What, what did the dollars changing hands mean? And it wasn't just about investing for the long term, but it was about the whole story. And a dreamer, an entrepreneur can come to this country, have an idea, raise money in the public markets to scale it and make it much bigger. And they can they create jobs along the way. They're scaling that for those products and services, making them available to the masses and not just the few with means. And they're allowing others to share in that success in the public markets. So once they take their company public, any other investor can be part of that and dream alongside them, plan for their own futures and plan for their retirement. And so when a company goes public, they're sharing that wealth creation. And so one of the concerns that we have and one of the things that we've seen is companies are waiting to go public much longer so they're growing really rapidly in the private markets, 
and then coming to the public markets later in their life cycle, after they've actually had those, those most dramatic rapid growth years, which means the, the shared success story isn't quite what it was if we don't get them out to the public market sooner. So people don't hold it against somebody for building a business, but they do have to share that success. So that, that's one element that's really important. The second part is having access in the markets for others to be there, to be able to participate and, and get the benefit of sharing. And those things are contributing to the wealth divide. We've seen this past year, the participation of retail investors has grown dramatically as, as, as uh, so, many, so, so many of us have been watching. And so that's a good thing. We need to balance that though with education so that retail investors are trading with an informed outlook and they're not taking undue risk because markets don't go up forever. Right, right. Now, maybe you could just a couple of things that I actually want to double click on there. So number one is, you know, shared story of success. And I'm, I'm sure you get this asked all the time, you know, why we've experienced such a sharp disconnect between what we've seen this past year in public markets versus what occurred in the real economy. When you get that question, what do you tell people? Uh, there's a few different things going on there. One, the, the public markets were there when we needed them during, during the, in the midst of the global pandemic. If you look back to the spring, we saw the IPO market shut down, but public companies that were already public were raising more dollars to support their businesses when they were under stress. So industries that were being impacted by the pandemic, like airlines and hospitality and, and you know all the hotel industries, the restaurant industries, they were raising money in the public markets to get through this piece. And they were able to do that very, very efficiently at a lower cost of capital. It really highlighted the value of the public markets. And so we did start to see more companies coming to the, the public markets then because they had to raise money in the private markets. And that was actually much more expensive, turned out to not be so, so effective. So we started to see that pendulum swing. Now it went so well that so many other companies started to, to ex expedite and accelerate their transition to the public markets. That's really been a, 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 a pulley for the overall market. I and mean, we had the busiest IPO market in our history in 2020. Who would have guessed that when mm -hmm. we were battling such a, such a significant pandemic? But that's really what we've seen. Now we, we, we wanna make sure that, that investors are educated about these companies. And there are certainly examples of companies whose valuations seem hard to explain. And the divide between the main street investor or the main street person, right? Even outside of the investment community, certainly you look at the stock market and you think everything's just fine. Everyone's doing great. We're trading at all time highs, but the, that, that's not what people are feeling, right? I mean, the, this pandemic is, was not an equal uh, opportunity employer. I mean, like it literally has de decimated so many individuals' businesses. We have to address that. Now, the way we've seen many, many uh, companies and others doing this by giving back, holding an event like this, or, or finding ways to, to donate to their local communities. We donate $10 million to, to COVID relief, to businesses that were impacted. We've seen so many companies that transitioned their businesses to create PPE. We've seen Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson and Eli Lilly, all, all companies that use their, their public prowess to go out there and par solve for the problems by creating vaccines. So I think part of the issue that we have is making sure that people see the real benefits of right. big corporations and the, the variety of ways that they're giving back and we're telling that story. But we also need to close that divide and make sure that others can share in, in that wealth creation. Yeah, no, for sure. And I wanna come back to something else you mentioned. Um, you know, you, you talked about uh, fewer companies or companies going public later. Um, how much of a role does, you know, uh, do you see the larger market participants that are currently public when you think about like the Facebooks or the Googles of the world, as they're gobbling up companies that would have previously listed directly and making the big even bigger? How, what are your thoughts on that and the ramifications for markets? Yeah, we've created a, a, a marketplace that is really successful for large investors and large companies. And so there's a lot of overhead. There are a lot of benefits from being a public company. You can raise money, like I said, at a much more, the public markets are the most liquid markets in the world. So you can really efficiently get access to capital. You have currency in your stock price that allows you to engage in M&A and use your stock to purchase others. You have the visibility and credibility of being a public company. So those are all really good things. It also comes with a lot of responsibility. You now need to be able to articulate your ESG story around how you're giving back to, to the environment, to, to social causes. 
you have to be able to uh, file disclosures as part of a public company and, and provide a lot of information. You have to worry about no longer knowing who your direct investor base is, but being able to anticipate their needs and being able to respond to reporting or earnings quarterly. All of those things just take work. So large companies have an easier time doing that. Can, they can hire a whole team that can deal with that. And that scale has led to smaller companies being acquired. And, and that's where you start to see fewer opportunities for investors. I think we need to address some of those responsibilities and make sure that we're not out of balance between the benefits of being public and the obligations that come with it. Our markets are always about balance and we right. can't lose sight of that. We need to make sure we're addressing the balance and recognizing when, when it's not in balance. Right, no, absolutely. And, and coming back again to one of the first things you said was kind of the intricacies of how the exchanges operate. So again, I think you've identified that for many investors and market participants, it's like as foreign as how your exchange operates as you know how the engine of their cars works to get them from point A to point B, right? And um, virtually everybody listening to you is an investor of some sort. So what would you say are the most important things for investors to be mindful of about the exchanges and what are some of the kind of risks or opportunities that may emerge from that? Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. I think it's a really good important point, especially for people who have been close to the investment industry for a long time, recognizing the fact that even the investment industry is changing and evolving and understanding what the new dynamics are. And you mentioned a car. It, it's, if you just think about that as an analogy, when people first started driving cars, they didn't have seatbelts. And then we put seatbelts on to start limiting that risk, but they were lap belts. What we learned was as cars started going faster, the lap belts actually were even more dangerous because they could cause their own injuries until we right. evolved them with three points. And if you equate that to markets and you think about tools that people use traditionally like stop orders to limit risk, that actually in today's markets create more risk. And they create, if there's no limit on them, you have to actually have a limit price on your order. Where traditionally people felt like, I'm just going to buy something at the market price and I'm going to get the best price out there in the market. Well, today's markets move a lot faster. And we certainly see it when you're using technology in the way that we are. Your markets move quickly. You have to use a different set of tools to protect yourself and to protect your customers. When we saw the major market volatility in March, the messages that we processed at the New York Stock Exchange, and when I say messages, I'm talking about orders to buy, new prices, cancellations, any updates on an order across all of our markets. We processed 330 billion messages in one day. Hmm. Now, you mentioned Google. They do single digit billion Google searches worldwide in a day. So we're talking 330 billion messages. And that was three times our previous peak record of 110. So that's, things are moving fast. You know, we need to make sure that we are educated and using the tools that protect us today. It's a big, it's a big part of how markets evolve. And that's part of my job is to make sure we're doing education, make sure we're putting the protections in place to handle market volatility and market moves in today's markets. We triggered market-wide circuit breakers four times in, in March, you know, and, and they're designed thoughtfully to slow the market down during the time of stress. And that, that's an important part of how the markets performed, how they operate and why we have to foresee the issues that might happen and plan for them so that we aren't trying to take any drastic action in the midst of, of an issue like that. And, and you know, one, one more quick anecdote on the, on the market-wide circuit breakers. You know, if you remember back in March, it was scary times. You know, the, the, the volatility in the market was dramatic. People were watching their 401ks decline at each day, you know, at each and every day, and they were concerned about it or at least the paper value of their, of their 401ks. And so there were started to be some people suggesting that we should just halt trading on the markets and shut the markets down in, entirely. And I got that request, the chairman of the SEC was getting that request from people. And we were, we were both emphatically articulating and telling the world, we are not considering closing down the markets. If you add to panic by saying we're panicking, it would be you know, even worse. So at the time, I was, I was clear that we weren't doing that. I got, I got a calls from the former Treasury, Secret, Treasury Secretary, Nick Brady, uh, who is the uh, Treasury Secretary under Reagan. And he you know, wanted to make sure that I was not going to move to shut down the markets and that the market-wide circuit breakers he designed after the 1987 crash. You know, the, they, they came together and looked for what did we learn from this and how do we slow the markets down? And the whole point was to have a measured response 
in the midst of crisis that people would know about and not not um you know not have a knee jerk reaction that that leans into that. It was really important to keep the markets open. Wow, wow, uh, must have, yeah, it must have been an interesting month for you to live through. I mean, for all of us, but you in particular. So just as we think about the craziness of 2020, um, what permanent changes have come out of it? And has the, the trading floor or the traditional trading floor become somewhat of a anachronism? Like, is, it, is, it, is everybody trading digitally? And like, what's the vision for stock exchanges of, of the future? Yeah, the, the best part of a crisis, and it's hard to say that, but the best part of a crisis is to figure out what you can learn from that and where, what you can leverage to going forward. And, and we're really good as an industry in doing that. And you know, I gave the example of market-wide circuit breakers, that's one. But with the trading floor, yeah, we operate, you, you mentioned when you're introducing me that we operate five different equity exchanges. Only one of them has a trading floor. That's our gold standard market. And the reason why we invest in the floor and keep it is because it leads to better trading, which saves investors money and it saves companies money that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So we continue to, to uh, keep that floor because our stocks trade better. And the, that's just the fact. What we didn't know was how much of our outperformance comes from the fact that we have people standing on the floor and how much of our outperformance comes from the fact that we have a model that introduces accountability. So that job that I had growing up as a specialist is, is still exists today. It's a designated market maker who has that accountability of overseeing trading in, in the stocks that are listed here. They're doing it largely electronically with the advantage of human judgment applied strategically. When we had to close the floor in March because of the pandemic, it was the first time that we continued ever to have the New York Stock Exchange open and running, but the trading floor closed. So we traded fully electronically. We've tested it for years and we know we can do it. We've never chosen to do it. And it's an experiment I wouldn't have chosen to run, but having access to that data was really interesting because now for the first time we could measure what comes from the people and what comes from the model. And what we saw was our stocks trade uh, still traded better than you know, a fully, other fully electronic exchanges, but not as well as when the floor was open. So it comes from both. So having accountability contributes to why stocks uh, trade with narrower spreads uh, on the NYSE and, and less volatility, but also that the accountability and the, and the people combined is really what makes it unique. So we're going to invest in that and build on the trading floor. It's, it's, not, it's, it's still giving value. And as long as our customers get value from it, we're going we're gonna to keep investing in it. Could you maybe just explain that a little bit? It's somewhat counterintuitive that the trading floor, manual, interpersonal dynamic makes the market that 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 exchange more efficient. Like, why yeah. is that? It's it's because if you think about what they're doing on the floor is not what we were doing on the floor several years ago. So the traders on the floor are using technology. They're using algorithms to trade. They're applying human judgment to adjust the algorithms to step in during times of stress, much like other industries that have scaled up with technology. So, you know, part of why I left the floor was sort of the conflict of people in technology. If it wasn't really integrated in a, in a thoughtful way, it, it can create conflict. What we've done was really integrated it so that the people and technology are stronger and more powerful together. So the technology is what people are using, but then the judgment is an overlay on that. So during times of stress, I'll give you one example. In the middle of, um, of the uh, pandemic in, in March, on a Friday afternoon, right at a, a couple of minutes or right at four o'clock, President Trump announced that he was going to have the oil reserves filled. So mm -hmm. we saw a number of the oil stocks receive massive buy orders right before the closing auction. At four o'clock, our gates come down and people can't enter orders anymore. So there would have been sellers that would have responded to the fact that there were a lot of buy orders coming into the market, except for that the sellers weren't allowed to come into the closing auction anymore because the gates were closed. The people involved in that process said, well, that doesn't make sense. Let's reopen the gates. And our rules allow us to extend the closing auction. And our auctions closed a few minutes later than, than normal, but at prices that were better prices for investors. Mm -hmm. that, that's instead of having trades go off. Those, those closing auctions, that, that, and, and they did, the auctions in fully electronic markets occurred hundreds of percentage points higher than where those stocks were, only to have those trades then busted where they, they didn't exist anymore, the trades were unwound, or those stocks come right back down. And that's a bad thing for investors when investors see major market moves like that. So applying human judgment at strategic moments is how we can help dampen volatility. Wow, fascinating. That's fascinating. 
So, it, it, okay, so let's, um, you know, you, you've mentioned a number of things there. I mean, and you talked about the fact that uh, out of this extraordinary year that was 2020, accompanied by many, many challenges, some of the positive outgrowths in terms of better data, the IPO boom, um, you know, you talked about uh, how the value some of the companies have provided in time of need. What, you know, when you think about some of the um, other positive outgrowths of it that are most relevant to investors, mm -hmm. what are some of those positive shifts or trends that you witnessed uh, or are witnessing as a result of what happened in 2020? Yeah, I think across across our, not just for the NYC, across our listed company base and really, really uh, across the nation more broadly, we're going to see a number of trends that, that, that will continue to be part of the challenges we faced in 2020 and our responses from there. So one of them, if you think about the fact, the readiness for global pandemic, right? Clearly we weren't ready. What did we learn from that? And just like every other business that, that hits a time of stress, you sure, you sure are up for that later, right? So we're going to improve on, I mean, right now we're obviously focused on vaccine dissemination and, and being able to get people vaccinated, but then we're, you're going to see a lot of changes made around readiness for and and plans pre pre there's a lot of debate around what the right steps were that's where you're going to see effort put into what so we have a plan going forward just like we do with market wide circuit breakers uh this year was also the past 12 months was was also very challenging from a, a diversity perspective as we talked and asked ourselves a lot of hard questions about whether or not racial justice is where it needs to be and clearly the answer was no right we know this and so a lot of companies unlike i've ever seen before are making this a priority in a way that's just much higher than, than we've seen, focusing on diversity and inclusion, focusing on their own teams and communities and really driving meaningful change. And you mentioned the NYC Board Advisory Council that we had launched a couple of years ago to help create diverse boards so that we can really focus diversity through the organization. So uh, d &I is certainly another area of, of change that we're gonna see in the coming years. Digital transformation is absolutely an area that was accelerated so dramatically over the past 12 months that we're going to start to really see the face of work look a little bit differently going forward. And companies that uh, implemented new technologies during, because they had to, right? Companies that either were using Zoom and other, other tools to, to work remotely are not going to throw those things away when they don't have to use them anymore. You're going to find a way to integrate them into your day-to-day -day business. Now, everybody got forced to work remotely. And I, the, the message I heard from literally every CEO I spoke to in March was they were shocked and surprised and pleased by how successfully their teams operated with 100% remote workforce. And they nobody would have guessed it would have been so seamless. Months later, there isn't unanimous views anymore on how effective it is to work remotely. People are feeling strain in different parts of their business. They're seeing an impact on mental health across their employee base. They're seeing an impact on collaboration and mentoring. There, so there's going to be a balance, again, balance around what is the right mix of remote work and in-person work. And you'll see companies asking themselves that question and what tools they want to use. Where did the technology that they implemented over the past 12 years make them more efficient? And, and where would they like to go back to having people involved? So we all now have to do virtual meetings now, but not 100% of our meetings are going to be virtual in, in 12 months. Yeah. Let me, uh, first of all, thank you. I, I want to change topics a little bit because uh, one of the most interesting things is, you know, even in your short time at the uh, tenure at the NYSE in, uh, as president, you've led all sorts of innovations in capital markets, particularly with the development of the direct listings, the evolution of SPACs or, you know, special purpose acquisition vehicles as kind of an alternative to, uh, to the traditional IPO for companies looking to access public markets. So maybe I want to dig into those two and uh, let's starting with SPACs, is the growth in SPACs sustainable? I mean, you're seeing an explosion in, is it sustainable? And could they become the preferred route for companies um, listing, for companies going to market? I think what you're going to see is a mix of SPACs, direct listings and IPOs. I don't think the traditional IPO is going away, but companies that are looking to take their companies public now are, have more choices than they've ever had before. And there are different pros and cons to each one of the ways to go public. So SPACs provide companies with more control and it's, it's a, a quicker way to get to the public market. So sometimes a smaller company that may not have 
uh, the companies are more likely to go out a little bit earlier in their life cycle, which is a good thing to getting uh, public investors access to those opportunities. And they're relying on the expertise and prowess of the SPAC sponsor and their experience in the market to help them do that and very often capital that they're infusing. So there's a mix of reasons why that, that is helpful for, for SPACs or companies that might want to choose a SPAC. They're also, when they, when they use a SPAC to go public, they're allowed to provide forward-looking guidance and future projections about their business, which you're not allowed to do in a traditional IPO. So if you are a company that, that has, uh, has, less, has less access to prior history, thinking about the ED companies or other companies whose story is really about where the market's going and not where the market is. A lot of EV companies are choosing SPACs because they need to be able to tell the story about projections. It's less about years of, of financial records to, to show. With direct listings, sim that, that's also a part of that, that offering there. So I think SPACs are something though that investors are gonna keep using. There are a lot of them. Uh, there are over 220 SPACs out there in the market now looking for an acquisition company. And, and just in, in case people aren't wholly familiar with SPACs, it's where a, a, a sponsor raises money, does an IPO, and IPOs the SPAC with no business operations. So it's a special purpose acquisition corporation. And then they go out and they have two years to go identify a company that they want to combine with. And at the time of that business comp combination is when that company goes public. So it's sort of flipping the IPO to, to before the, the uh, process. With that, there's... Um, you know, there's the SEC is, is a little bit more comfortable with it because the, if you invested in the SPAC, you can get your money back. You vote on whether or not you like the business acquisition and you can get your money back if you don't, so you can redeem. So those are elements as to, it, it becomes an, a way for investors to in, invest in almost like treasuries, right? They can earn some money in the SPAC while the, while the combination is, is uh, being found. And then they can have that option for the for the business combination if it, if they like it. So that's an interesting development. But I do think there's an awful lot of them out there, and they're not all going to be successful. So right. investors need to be cautious around where where they're putting their dollars. And and if you could compare and contrast that to direct listings, um, uh, if I could ask you to do that. Yeah, direct listings. I mean, so this one's really interesting, and and I get excited because we've been working on this one for a few years. But that's a result of the fact that companies are going public for different reasons. If you think why, about why a company went public several years ago, they were going public primarily to raise money. And it was raising capital as the primary driver. The secondary tertiary reasons were the things we talked about earlier, that branding and visibility, the currency, or their liquidity for their early investors. Now, because of the access to private capital and the fact that companies are staying private so much longer, and that's where they're raising their money, they're going public for different reasons. They're going public for those, those secondary tertiary reasons are their primary driver. So if a company has been private for 10 years and they've been paying their employees with stock options uh, or, rest or restricted stock, those employees want to go buy a house, they need liquidity. So the public markets can provide that to them. And that's really what's forcing a lot of companies to choose to go public later is that they're trying to get those secondary tertiary. So it led to the question of, well, wait a minute, if I'm not going public to raise money, why should I do an IPO? and raise money, see a first day pop, and then you know leave all that money on the table. When you think about an IPO and it's up 80% the next day, you read the headlines and people say, wow, that was a really successful IPO. Unless you were the person who sold it the night before, you might not agree that it was so successful if you left a lot of money on the table. And right. so Barry McCarthy and Daniel Ek, so Barry was the CFO of Spotify, uh, they, they came up with the idea and said, well, if, I'm not, if it's not about raising money, why do I have to raise money? And they came to the New York Stock Exchange at the end of 2016, this is how long ago it was, and said, hey, we want to go public, but we don't want to do an IPO. Will you help us with this? And we worked for 18 months with them and the SEC on getting the SEC comfortable with it. And they were the first direct listing in, in April of 2018. We saw in the, in the next year or two companies saying, but what if I do want to raise money as part of my offering? can I let the market price my IPO just the way uh, Spotify let the market price their company? So we, for the past year and a half, have been working with the SEC on the next iteration of direct listings where you can raise money as part of it. So now companies can choose. They have an IPO, they have a direct listing, or they have SPAC. What the next phase will be is companies taking elements of each of those that make sense for them. So like in a SPAC and a direct listing, you can also provide forward-looking guidance and future projections. I would not be surprised to see the SEC consider evolving the IPO so that you can provide more information about the, the future 
progress of your business. You're seeing lockups and, and other changes coming into uh, elements around direct listings. And the reason why I like a direct listing so much is it really democratizes access. And we started off this conversation talking about sort of the benefits of, of public markets. And when an IPO is offered to an artificially constrained group the night before, only a subset of the market gets that benefit of that first day pop. Right. So in a direct listing, everybody's on a level playing field. All right. investors can go log into their accounts and, and buy shares on a level playing field. And that democratization is a really interesting development so we, you know, we don't actually have a bias for which one a company might choose. And from the NYC perspective, we'll, we'll bring companies public through, it, through any of those methods. But I think it's a really interesting development in the market. And I don't think we should underestimate the importance of providing equal ac access. Sorry. So in that spirit, um, do you imagine direct listings will one day become more accessible for smaller companies? I mean, at, right now it seems that it's only really practical for very large private businesses. Could that change? And would that, I mean, theoretically, that would radically transform private markets or the private equity yeah. industry or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's already it's already yeah. changing. You know, when, when Spotify first went this path, we thought that, you know, you had to have a brand name like Spotify to be able to do a direct listing. And you have to have a, a distributed shareholder base and a lot of holders so you could have liquidity. Already with the second direct listing, we saw that we were kind of wrong about how big of a brand name you needed to have. Slack was the second company to do a direct listing. And while they're very known in Silicon Valley, and, and frankly, the past year has probably made Slack better known across, across a lot of users, they weren't a household name the way Spotify was. And they, they were had a, had a successful direct listing. You're, Asana is another company that just went public. And so you're starting to see it doesn't really need to be uh, quite as ubiquitous as, as, you, as we originally thought, they can do an investor day. They can educate their investors. They can actually go on, on a roadshow the way the, they would have with an IPO and tell their story and attract investors. It's just how it gets priced. When they come in the, the next day, the market is pricing their offering. Hmm. So that, that actually relates to um, another topic, which I'd love to get your take on, you know, again, it's all under the rubric of democratizing the benefits of public markets, but um, the obvious benefit is 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 really liquidity, right? And um, some have argued, you know, I, I may have that, you know, just given the rise of indexation, automation, increased concentration, some of the larger securities within major industries, uh, within major indices. I'm sorry, um, that this liquidity may be tested, and so. Firstly, are you seeing any increased challenges to liquidity within capital markets? And particularly as we get into direct listings and so on, which may have a smaller addressable market. Um, but uh, I think the, well, let's pause it there. How are you thinking about uh, liquidity in the markets today and the prospect for that being challenged going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think people need to understand the what they're doing when they're investing in the market. And there's a lot of opportunity in the market, but there is also risk. And when you look at some of the valuations that we're seeing in the markets and 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 the liquidity and trading in the markets, we, markets don't go up forever, right? So we we need to recognize that investors need to be prepared for market moves in both directions. Now over time markets will go up, but but we need to make sure that there isn't an, an irrational exuberance around even at the single security level. And what we saw is there's a lot of concentration in a subset of the market. You see that within indexes and uh, people look at the index and we say, look how strong the market is. The index is actually reflective of a very small segment of the overall market. You know, there are 2,200 listed companies on the NYSE. And when you start looking at a handful of companies representing 25% of an index of the S&P 500, that that's that, you know, less than five companies representing 25% of the S&P 500, when you're looking at the S&P 500 to describe the overall public market, I, I, there's a bit of a disconnect there. So I, I think we do need to be cautious about liquidity and, and about the impact on of index investing. Just be aware of, of the correlation between different products and different asset classes. Right. And, and how much, in, in your opinion, how much is that liquidity worth? Like in, in the sense that many of the investors on the call today, that their family offices, their ultra high net worth, uh, investors who invest of, across the full range of liquid and illiquid asset classes. And they're always thinking about, you know, what is that illiquidity premium? What, what should it be? And how much 
you know, again, when you think about it, how do you, uh, what do you think the, that that liquidity of public markets is worth? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely getting the benefit of the public markets and you pay for that. There's also, if you look at the developments that we've seen in the public markets, if we provide access through new products and tools to what were very illiquid classes over the uh, over time, right? So things like ETFs provide access to illiquid uh, asset classes in a, in a wrapper that works like equities. And so there are a number of different varying tools out there that can actually uh, help solve for some of those liquidity issues that you described. And we've certainly seen that in certain, during times of stress in the, in the spring when liquidity was, was drying up in certain products, you could see that, that ETFs provided another source of liquidity in those names. So I think you know, where you look for it is changing a, a little bit. Uh, and you, we need to recognize that there are new tools out there and, and they can be used as, a, uh, as an asset when there is less liquidity in some products. Hmm. Um, interesting. And, and, and just moving to kind of another, again, a, a separate topic, but again, on the, in this uh, general theme of democratization of markets, you know, and it was recently announced, I believe that BACT, um, the digital asset marketplace is set to go public on the NYSE, right? Um, how do you view the rise of cryptocurrencies? I mean, we've seen those recent pops, but how do you imagine that will impact capital markets over the long term? Yeah, I think it's another it's another developing tool out there, right? And I think the new SEC administration and the new uh, CFTC administration, and all the new regulators in, are going to come in and start to to, to opine a little bit on on the de development of that space. What what's unique about Bact is it's actually not just cryptocurrency. So when Bact was initially founded. It was uh, in 2018. It was to buy, sell, spend, and store digital assets, but Bitcoin was primarily the, the, the product. And it developed institutional grade infrastructure around that trading and using our expertise at ICE and in markets to, to provide that institutional grade uh, uh, infrastructure. What we've evolved back to with uh, over, the, over the subsequent years is digital assets more broadly. So with an acquisition of a company called Bridge2, now you can have a wallet that is your hotel and airline points, your uh, any sort of tokens you might have from, from video games, Bitcoin, whatever digital assets you have, you can store them in your backed wallet and then use and spend them in the ways that matter for, for you, uh, you know, across, across, the, across the landscape. I think the markets are definitely going in that direction. And we'll see how that continues to evolve. And with respect to cryptocurrency, that's one element of that, but it's not the entire story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We've certainly and, seen you know, the rise in, in Bitcoin <laughs> over, over the past uh, several months. And a lot of that has to do with what we're seeing in the markets. Um, do you mind elaborating on that a little? Well, I just mean that you're seeing a lot of, of um, uh, you know, some, some investors are using Bitcoin almost as a proxy for gold. You know, I see, I see, I see. And, and do you see that uh, um, increasing that that trend? You know, I, I am no expert on Bitcoin. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying like you've certainly there's there are divided views on where that might where that might continue to go. And, and it's right. a still early stage product. Right. I mean, if you think about the if you compare Bitcoin to gold, right, we're in early innings with Bitcoin for sure. Right. So speaking of divided views, um, you, you have this uh, remarkable opportunity. I mean, it, before this call, I was saying to you that I, I want to be Stacy when I grow up because you're sitting um, at the crossroads of the world's smartest, greatest CEOs, government officials, regulators, investors, etc. And you get to hear all of these different perspectives and opinions pretty much every day. Based on those conversations, like what trends are you picking up on that most of us who are not in your seat wouldn't necessarily appreciate or, or glean? I think, I think everyone recognizes that we're at a crossroads this, 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 this moment in time, you know, and, and life is full of defining moments. We got faced with a lot of defining moments over the last 12 months. And we got, we got asked a lot of hard questions. And when I talk to CEOs or, or others, they're all reflecting on what that's going to mean for us, and it, like literally, Mo, if you think about it, as as people, as individuals, as family members, as businesses, on every front, we were really faced with a lot of tough questions. 
where we go from here is, is going to be an important turning point. And that's what people are talking about is one, whether it be the digital transformation, whether it be how we think about uh, elements of our government. If, if you think about the, uh, you know, ESG has been such a big part of what CEOs are focused on and giving back. Large corporations are are good for the for the uh, for for the communities that they that they live in and that they support, but we need to tell that story. And so they're giving back and they're focused on ESG and they're focused on the planet. None of that went away. It actually only got amplified over the past twelve months. And and you know I started January of twenty twenty, and I keep saying the past twelve months because I'm choosing to think about this year as a trailing twelve months because okay. January of twenty twenty started just fine. And so I'm giving 2021 a, a few weeks to, <laughs> to work out as kings to start to be on the upswing. But in January of 2020, I was at the World Economic Forum annual event in Davos. And the conversation, you know, funny thing about Davos is, is it's, it's widely joked that it's a contraindicator, that whatever the sentiment is at the Davos annual meeting is the, the year is the opposite of that. <laughs> you know, and, and in 2019, it was very pessimistic. People were concerned about recession and 2019 turned out to be just fine. In January of 2020, it was a very optimistic meeting. And most of the leaders there were talking about ESG and climate change. And that was 85% of the conversation was about how, how can we help uh, you know, change the world. And then shortly after, just, just days after literally the pandemic news started to really spread and 2020 became a really challenging year. The ESG narrative didn't go away though. It, it was still a big focus for companies. They're very focused on not only uh, making sure they're giving back to 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 uh, you know communities and and in the climate, but articulating and telling that story to investors and investors are increasingly focused on it. Over the past two years, we've seen the ET, uh, the professionally managed assets uh, that are invested in ESG strategies grow forty two percent, and now one in three of every dollar that's professionally managed. Is invested in the ESG strategy, so that's that's top of mind for a lot of leaders as they think about where where the where the world is going. And, and just on, on that note, like, what are some of the challenges that companies are still wrestling with vis-a-vis -vis ESG that that you are seeing? And so, you know, and and go ahead, yes, sir. I was going to say some of it's just around how they tell their story and data. So we collect data around 500 ESG criteria so that we can provide it not only to index providers, but also give it back to companies. And this is all the information that is out there on what they're disclosing, where, what, their, what their standards are, and, and it gives them an opportunity to correct that data. They struggle with the fact that there isn't any single standard, that there are a number of different uh, standards out there and, and different investors are looking for them to report in different ways. Centralizing that, standardizing that, and making it a simpler process that goes back to the challenges of being public versus private. And it, it's an onerous process to, to navigate. Mm -hmm. And do you see the NYSC playing a, a significant role in standardizing that process? Yeah, we already are. So we're collecting, we're collecting that data as one of the largest, really as ICE. ICE is one of the largest uh, data providing companies in, in the world, financial data. You know, and we are collecting that data across the public company universe and so that that can be used by other groups to provide ratings and recordings. And then we're giving guidance and providing standards around ESG to our listed companies so that they can help navigate that process. We hold a series of webinars and, and uh, present speakers to uh, and roundtable discussions across the listed company community. I mean, the, one of the things about our network that's so interesting is we do have the world's greatest community of companies. And so we can bring them together so they can help navigate some of these challenges by learning from each other. And we do that and create those opportunities for them. And ESG is one area of focus on that. And do you see uh, down the road, like if you could imagine the company of the future, you know, the public company of the future 10 years from now, um, some of the things that you would imagine being profoundly different than they are today or things that may be table stakes or what have you. And, and again, on the ESG topic, like is, do you think that this is a continuum like towards impact or, or, or you think that um, because some of the t some of the initiatives you mentioned at the beginning, at the outset of the conversation, were really impact oriented, not pure ESG, like act proactively trying to help communities. How do you see that trend um, as we look to the company of the future? I, I think I, I think so much of that has to come from listening to their stakeholders and what's being asked of them. And you know, it was interesting 
it was an interesting meeting when I mentioned the fact that we talked last year in, in Davos so much about ESG. I had a CEO come up to me on the first day of that event and say, you know, there, there, I've never had an investor ask me about ESG. And I was literally shocked. I thought he was wrong. I just thought like, that can't be true because investors are, I'm talking to investors and they're always talking about ESG. And he said, I, I've never done that, but I, but I do and started to list all the things they do around ESG. And he said, it's because our employees want to see it or it's, you know, his stakeholders more broadly. And so they had prioritized a number of things because of what was being asked of them, not necessarily by investors. And so it's important. And I think what you're going to see is not that companies are just responding to investor pressure on issues around, you know, whether it be diversity or climate or any of the other top of mind, but, but their stakeholders more broadly, they're going to define the path for what the companies of the future look like. It's going to be what's, what's being asked of them. And, and obviously not everyone has the same opinion on all, on all of these issues. And so that's what companies are going to be navigating. And it, it's not easy, right, to, to, to find that right balance of, of achieving those goals and, and prioritizing that. But investors are at least saying they're open to not just the investment in those initiatives, but recognizing that that can lead to better returns for them as investors also. So let's, if I could pick up on that, you know, we look at the returns on ESG companies over the last um, ESG uh, compliant companies and, and those that are focused on it, certainly they would have uh, seemed to have outperformed the broader market over the last call it 12 months or so. Um, do you see that as the market rewarding that leadership or is it something else in play? I, I do think the market is rewarding that leadership. And I think there are multiple things at play, but I think an important one that I do want to talk about is the market rewarding leadership. And part of that is because that that's markets, right? If markets want to see certain behavior, they need to put their dollars where they want to see it. And I believe she started off by saying I'm kind of a free markets person and I am. And I think that's an appropriate place for us to use our voices is by using our dollars. And so when we want to see certain behavior from a CEO and from a company, we need to tell them that we will reward them by investing in them for taking those actions. And I think that's a more important way to drive change than through just regulation or law where it might be done to check the box because it's not as meaningful. It's not, and, and it's not as successful if you don't mean it, right? So if you talk about diversity on, on a board, we're focusing on getting diverse board candidates into companies' boardrooms where the company wants that diversity. Now their investors are demanding it and in many cases, but they're getting, getting that benefit of that versus just saying you have to do it. And because we want, to, we want them to see, understand why they're doing it. And hopefully they're getting the benefit of having, you know, they see the benefit of having diverse viewpoints. But it, frankly, investors are demanding it and they should be demanding it. And we've seen the results. When we look at the companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the Russell 1000, 99% of them have a woman on their board. 96% have two or more. That's very different from where we were just a few years back. So we need to continue to drive that change by using using our, our wallets to, to, to see what we want. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, leadership has kind of been this big theme throughout the pandemic. Um, it's been a running theme and in many cases it's been absent, but we've also seen notable exceptions and, and just wonderful stories where it's been uh, remarkably present. You know, as you've interacted with all these CEOs and, and you've seen those that have done it well, as a, as a president, as somebody who heads your organization, what leadership lessons kind of have you brought from you know these other companies that you've seen from those that have done it well and and how does uh, how does some of that uh, speak to the culture that you're trying to uh, build at NYC SE? Well, during times of crisis, communication becomes even more critical, and so that's something that you know I I, I know and I it's easy to to get caught up in the moment though and start to reduce how much you're communicating and you have to go the other way you have to lean into it. I early on it, the first week in March, the very March second I think it was I was having a conversation with a CEO who said they were putting out daily communications about COVID, and I said that's a really good idea because people are reading the news and they're worrying about what's happening and they don't know what's happening they don't know what actions we're taking you're seeing news about uh, some businesses going remote and others weren't yet. And so I suggested, and we pulled, you know, our team pulled, came together and we started putting out a daily update. We expected that when we started our COVID daily update, it was going to have the new, inf the same information some days because there wouldn't be anything new to say. And so that's okay. At least then people will know 
nothing's changed. We're still doing this. This is our plan. And we don't, even if it, even if it doesn't say anything new, let's just still make sure we're talking every single day about what's happening. Right. Every single day, there was something new to say, because that's how quickly the news was changing, if you remember back in March. So it mm -hmm. did become you know, pretty, uh, it, it wasn't quite as standard as I thought. But that was something that we've heard a lot from employees was helpful, because you need that touch point. Now people are distributed in their homes and trying to make sense of the world and having that level of communication, I think is really critical. So it's a lesson that I'm reminded of throughout my career if you are not telling your own story, somebody else is gonna fill in the gaps and it's not gonna be the story that's true. So I always say no Mad Libs. If you leave blanks <laughs> in the story, people will fill it in. And if you ever read Mad Libs, they're crazy stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. Stacey, I know we're running up against time here. So maybe just one more question. Um, you know, Given everything that is happening in the world today, what are some of the greatest risks that you're thinking about? What are some of the greatest risks you're concerned about? And what are some of the opportunities that you're most excited about? If we could kind of get your quick feedback on, on those two sides. I mean, the they're almost the same thing. I, 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 we've obviously seen over the past few weeks that there's a lot of division and a lot of different viewpoints out in the world. And that does keep me up at night. I mean, watching the Capitol being stormed in early January was my saddest day as an American in my entire history. And having lived in the middle of 9-11, and all of those moments, it wasn't as, as heartbreaking as what I saw then. And it really was because of what we were doing to each other and how lost we've, we've gotten uh, amongst each other. So that division really concerns me. If we don't address the problems that lead to it and that, that are contributing to why people feel so apart, and, and that's, that's, that's a real issue. And I think we absolutely have to do that. But with that crisis comes opportunity. If we get that right and we start to really heal and, and focus on not just transitioning to the next thing, but solving some of the underlying concerns, we can be stronger than we've ever been before. And I'm excited and optimistic that, that we will put the time and energy toward doing that. Stacey, that was just fantastic. I uh, really can't thank you enough for joining us, for sharing your incredible insights with us. And uh, really, we so appreciate your generosity of your time and your wisdom, and certainly hope we can do it again soon. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much for having me, Mo. And thanks again to everybody who's been contributing to such a good cause. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just for all of our particip participants, thank you for joining us. If you haven't donated yet, please do so by going to the donate page at the top right of the site. We appreciate you helping us strengthen the healthcare of our communities. And Stacey, thanks again for your support of Lunch of the Legends. Uh, we're eternally grateful for your participation and look forward to seeing you again soon. Great, thanks. Have a great day.